Hi, everyone. This is Achuta Bhava from Nightlight Astrology, and today I'm really excited to begin a new series on the beliefs of ancient astrologers. So the reason that I'm doing this series is because a couple of years ago, back in 2019, I began researching um, the, uh, the history of ancient astrology from a philosophical and sort of theological perspective. I wanted to know what did ancient astrologers believe? Even though I've been practicing astrology for a while, um, my own faith path in the bhakti yoga tradition was getting a lot more um, focused and, and committed. And so I wanted to know what did ancient astrologers, both in the East and the West, believe about the universe, the soul, God, astrology itself? What did they think it was? What did they think its, its intended use was? Where did they think it came from? Um, and I wanted to know that just for my own sake, because I, I wanted to understand how to how the, the my my full time work and my you know one of my my passion in life the study of astrology study and practice of astrology fit in with or maybe diverged from my my practice of of bhakti yoga so it was a couple of years worth of research and in 2019 some of that research coalesced into a few talks that I gave on the beliefs of ancient astrologers and since then I've been refining my understanding you know it, it's uh, it's a never ending process as a student right. And I decided I would do a series breaking down the articles of faith that ancient astrologers had um, because, for a few reasons. One, because I get asked all the time, like, what do astrologers believe? Is it a religion? Like, like what is it? And what do you have to believe to do, do or study astrology? Um, and I get asked that a lot. I also get asked um, from, I get asked by people all of the time because I have a, a very committed spiritual practice. Um, you know, again, like do with their spiritual practice, whether it's Christianity or I've had, I've had Sufis, Christians, Muslims, you know, Buddhists. I've had so many different people on different faith paths in life. Christians say Jewish, uh, uh, practicing Jewish people say, you know, is astrology compatible with my faith path? And, you know, I think the purpose of this series is to break it down into the most basic fundamental tenets of faith or belief that ancient astrologers most likely had. There's not any text that exists in the ancient world that I've ever read from astrologers saying this is what you have to believe to practice or do astrology, right? It doesn't, it's not like that. So, and we also know that over the course of 2000 years, um, as one of my colleagues, Jen Zart, likes to say, there are many astrologies, but like plural, not just singular, right? So astrology is a very flexible, um, I would call it a divinatory tool that gets used by many different faith traditions. Um, but still, I believe that um, the more that I've looked into the roots of the Greco-Roman, Hellenistic, Greek world, the axial age that astrology was uh, springing forth um, from within the comparative beliefs of Eastern and Western philosophers at the time that astrology was in its heyday or, and, and really making its presence felt in the world, the more that I'm convinced that to do astrology as it was intended to be done and as it was understood, even in the broadest terms, there are some basic articles of faith that you do see recurring in both the East and the West in the use and practice of astrology. So the purpose of this series is to break those beliefs down so that people, not necessarily so that you have to adopt them or you have to believe everything that ancient astrologers believed, so that people can be aware of the core faith tenets of this ancient practice. And whether they fit for you or not today is really up to you. Um, I certainly, again, I, I would say to, to defend um, some of my friends and colleagues who are atheists or agnostics, um, you can practice astrology without really taking up any of the beliefs of ancient astrologers. Many people will understand astrology as a, a kind of mythopoetic mytho uh, um, art form. People will understand it as a, a kind of symbolic, psychological, therapeutic language, which does not really require any commitment, if anything, just an openness to the mystery, right? And so by doing this series, I also don't want to appear uh, condemning of people who may not, who the jury, you know, the jury may well be out for many people on some of these articles of faith. And that's fine. Um, but for people who are saying like, you know, I, I kind of want to know what astrologers believed, there's some good reasons to know why. And I'll, I'll talk about those in a second. But I also want to push back in the other direction and say that 
you know, there's perhaps no other religious or spiritual tradition in the world that's been as as flexible and adaptable as astrology because it's adapted to many different religions and philosophical schools of thought. Um, and that's a credit to something about astrology itself that's really, truly beautiful. Um, at the same time, I would say that no matter how astrology has changed or adapted, it probably hasn't ever lost at least most of the core articles of faith that I'm going to present in this series. And if we don't adopt these articles of faith, I'm tempted to say we're not doing astrology. We're not doing, I don't want to say real astrology, that sounds a little too intense, but almost like we're, we're not doing astrology as it was understood and used by the vast majority of its practitioners over the past couple of thousand years, even if there were different schools of philosophical or theological thought that were, that, that were adapting or using astrology within their framework. There are still a number of core beliefs that I, I'm not sure we're really doing astrology if we don't take them up. That doesn't mean that as, astrological language can't be used for other things. Right. It doesn't mean I'm not. I'm not suggesting that um, the same language and tools uh, and and techniques and so forth couldn't be applied for another agenda. I just want to make it clear also that I'm not. I'm not sure. I really see when it, when we start departing from these core articles of faith that I'm going to present in this series. I'm not sure we're really doing astrology any longer. But anyway, that's just a personal opinion. You know, take it or leave it. Uh, so a few reasons to. Um, that to do this series again before I go into um, part one today. Um, the first one is people always ask, you know, is astrology a spiritual or religious path? And I hope that this series sort of addresses that and shows how it is, but it's also very flexible. Um, it's important to know, to understand what ancient astrologers thought that astrology was, where they thought it was coming from, and what they thought its intended use was. Um, both practically and, let's say, esoterically or spiritually. Um, and it's also, it's nice to know these things so that I can say, do I fall in line with these beliefs or, you know, where do I still have question marks? I think we're all, you know, we're all eternal students. And so it's it's fine also if some of the beliefs of ancient astrologers, we, you know, we may not know if we uh, agree with or not, right? So, this is a good way to clarify that for ourselves, to look into these things. And that's why I approach the topic myself. It's also helpful to know these core faith articles that ancient astrologers had because people will ask you, if you practice and study astrology long enough, people will literally ask, so like, what is, what is astrology? Why do you do it? What do you believe? People will make assumptions about what you believe, and so it's helpful to have them articulated and to clarify them for, for yourself. And that's exactly why I did it, because in my practice and in my family life and, and social life, I was being asked more and more. And I, I recognized at a certain point that I didn't know, that I had answers that I was making up that seemed legitimate to me, but I wanted to do some historical research to find out what, who, what did the people who received this or invented it or however we want to think about it, what did they think about it? What did they? Where did they think it come from? It came from, and so forth. It's hard to know why we're practicing or what the aim or purpose of our practice is if we haven't addressed what astrology is and why we do it. What kind of universe does it claim uh, that we live in? Right. Uh, okay. So the benefits. The benefits of doing this is that the more that we understand what astrology is and why we do it, um, the more that. Also, our lifestyle, the way we live, think, make decisions, uh, treat our body, our mind, can start to um, support the core claims or faith articles of our practice. It's like once you know what you believe, then the rest of your life can become, you can make choices to help support your practice and astrology can become more cohesive and more supportive as a spiritual practice in your life. You know, your if you practice with clients or if you study seriously as a student, astrology is going to start to refine itself in a number of different ways. You're going to be really careful about who and what you tune into as a teacher or as a text or as lectures or conferences or communities. You're going to start to know, okay, do these communities or do these teachers or do these texts or the this these different philosophical takes on astrology sort of fall in line with my articles of faith. Um, so, so because 
it, there's a lot of decisions to be made out there when you're a student or a practitioner. So we're getting a sense of what your core beliefs are is going to refine your practice and refine your studies. It's going to help you become more um, deliberate and attentive about your choices as a student. And then finally, in my humble opinion, my practice has become a lot clearer and a lot more cohesive and a lot more helpful to other people because I know what I believe and I know what I believe the intended use and practice of astrology is meant for. So with all of that being said, the first article of faith that we are going to talk about now, what, again, what I've done in this series is I've broken all of these different articles of faith that ancient astrologers appear to have had into categories. The first one today that we're going to talk about is the notion of an ordered cosmos. And bef- and I'm going to dive into that and talk about how we see that appearing in both the East and the West. Um, And I won't have as much preliminary rambling in in future videos. I'm just kind of setting up the series in this one. But um, before I do this, what I want to say is that um, there are a number of source texts that I recommend um, where, you know, some of the heavy amount of my research came from. And I will put those as a list into uh, the chat box so you can see books that I recommend that all of this research came from. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is also, how did I do this? Because again, it's not like the texts themselves have a lot of very deep philosophical and theological statements being made that give you a lot of insight and they give you the mood of what ancient astrologers believed, but there aren't, um, there aren't as many, you know, texts that are just explicitly like, here's our doctrines or dogmas about the universe or what we believe about the soul or God or divinity or why we're doing this. So you kind of have to um, you have to dig and figure out what were the most likely schools of philosophy that were informing the development or practice of astrology in both the East and the West, and broadly speaking, what were the because the, there's a lot of there's going to be a lot of variation from school to school. So you're, I'm also looking for agreement among all of the schools. What broadly speaking, what did all of these different schools of philosophy or or religious uh, practice believe? What did they share in? And that's how I um, derived these faith articles. So it's not to say that there wasn't still a lot of variation. You have people like, um, you know, you have the Pythagoreans, you have a a rich Greek philosophical tradition, right? You have the Pythagoreans, you have the Platonists, you have the Hermeticists, you have the Orphics, you have the Stoics. Um, There's some I'm missing too, but you have kind of the Plato- slash Aristotle, Aristotle and the Aristotelian tradition that starts influencing. Um, that's a little bit later. Then, you know, in the East, you're going to have Indian philosophy that stems from the Vedic and Upanishadic tradition and so forth. So drawing on all of it, what were the common beliefs? That's where this list comes from. Uh, so part one today is the notion of an ordered cosmos. So For the Greeks, the concept that we lived in an ordered cosmos was most likely foundational to the practice of astrology. So this is a faith statement. It's it's a belief that the cosmos is um, is ordered, harmonious, just, good, beautiful, and true. So for the Greeks, a a word that's used is harmonia, Um, and this concept of harmonia was pervasive as early as the last millennium BCE, which is the millennium within which horoscopic astrology is being developed. But um, it's, it's, it's mentioned by several key philosophers as well. So I'll I'll get into that in a second, but Hesiod mentions it as early as 700 BCE in his theogony. So this is like a sort of like a historian and um, you know, he's mentioning this, a long time before astrology comes about, that we live in an, an, a universe that displays harmony and order and, and, and a kind of balance. Um, for uh, Heraclitus, who is a pre-Socratic philosopher who lived from circa 535 to 475 BCE, harmonia was defined by Heraclitus as an eternal cosmological principle whereby opposites in the material world were joined together in proper relationship with one another. And he was also the one who famously connected character and fate, saying man's character is his fate. Now, 
you know, many people have done really deep uh, cross um, comparisons between Heraclitus and Taoist, early Taoist philosophy. So this is, we're going to see in a minute that there, there's counterparts to this in the East as well. So that's the, that's, that's where this is coming from though, broadly speaking in the, in the Western esoteric tradition, this idea of cosmic harmony, the Pythagoreans, and this is going to date roughly 570 BCE to about 495 BCE also thought of harmonia as a force that was governing the orderly fitting together of sound and that the good of the human soul consisted in grasping and assimilating to that order. And you have to remember that the planets were thought of as um, music. They were related to musical, um, like the, the musical scale, the music of the spheres, right? So we have this idea that Harmonia, uh, for whether you're going from all the way back to Hesiod to Heraclitus to Pythagoreans, coming down the the years, this is a pervasive idea that influences Greek thought. Um, Plato takes it up as well. We see Plato and a lot of other Greek philosophers envisioning a cosmos that's ordered and harmonious. So it's a combination of beauty, truth, justice, and goodness. And um, that this is this is the highest level. And of course, within that. Uh, framework, you'll hear philosophers talking about the place that chaos and strife play, but they still play a role within the the larger sphere of of harmony. So, um, now if we go over to the east for Indian philosophers, as early as the Rig Veda, um, which is you know going to be dated variously by different scholars, and I don't want to get into a big argument about how old the Vedas are, but they're old, right? The parallel concept of ritta is used to denote a very similar idea. The Rig Veda contains over 400 instances of the noun ritta as well as its adjectival form. Now, as an adjective, ritta means ordered, right, righteous, brave, efficient, true. As an adverb, it means rightly, correctly, properly, strongly, and it also means a fixed order, determination, or decision. So that has behind it the idea that the will of the gods in creation is right, ordered, just, correct, proper, strong, efficient, true, and also the idea that the cosmos itself is uh, hangs together because of this principle. Uh, Ritta also means order in sacred matters, sacred customs, uh, pious work, divine law, uh, order, faith, and it is some, it, it's like the epitome of religious truth or the right or true path, and that the cosmos is, is um, made cohesive because of this. Interestingly, it's also associated with the images of a path, like a pathway that you walk down, much like the Tao is, a seat, a wheel, a river and has astronomical associations with the wheel of the heavens, just like the Zodiac is thought of as a wheel. The Rig Veda in particular tells us that the sphere of being, life, and truth is regulated by Ritta. Well, similarly, um, the word in Sanskrit, Sat, or kind of broadly speaking, being and, and truth um, to kind of camped in together um, is also related in the Vedas to Ritta and both are opposed to asat, or non-being and untruth, and unritta, or that which lacks in meaningful order. Very similarly, Plato is talking about, you know, the world of, of shadows versus the, the world of truth, the, the un, an understanding of the higher forms in the mind of God, which the Hermeticists take up as well. So, the idea here is that there is a higher order and higher truth with ph which philosophers, sages, yogis, astrologers, all sorts of different esotericists are interested in that they that they see and believe that the universe hangs together because of this principle, um, expressed you know slightly differently in different traditions. But that is one of the most core. I think that's why I started it here because that's like a core faith statement for astrologers for the past couple of thousands of years thousand years, 2000 plus years. So what do ancient astrologers believe? The very most basic thing in a sense that you have to believe to do astrology as it was believed and practiced in the ancient world for, and largely for the last 2000 years, is that the universe is inherently 
good, ordered, meaningful, um, and that it, it hangs together because of this kind of cosmic harmony. So, you know, that's that's a kind of faith statement because you could surely make a great case for the presence of, of chaos, randomness, chance, meaninglessness, uh, you know, et cetera, right? Um, it's not also that ancient astrologers or ancient philosophers didn't believe in the presence of chaos or luck or chance. Um, it's that they, they saw it camped within a, a larger cosmic harmony. They saw it as a force that, that had, still had its eternal place within this ordered whole. Um, from the Rig Veda, we also get this claim that everything emanated from a single principle. There are apparent opposites within the manifest cosmos, but because they come from the same source, they are also related together cohesively, complementary. Um, they, they're complementary ultimately due to this principle of Ritta, which again is like the, the Western counterpart is harmonia. And this is something that I had the chance to read several scholarly essays about, which I'll uh, again, I'll put the, my bibliography into the chat box so you can check out some of these books if you're interested. But that was the one I was was really deeply impressed by was how pervasive this basic view of the cosmos was in both the East and the West at the time that astrology comes about. So at the very least, I believe that this is something that you it's almost like you can't do astrology as a spiritual practice as it was understood or intended to be used without this basic article of faith. Now, that doesn't mean, again, that people won't use astrology for different, that it can't be used for other purposes or that people have to believe this, otherwise you're a fake or phony. I'm just saying, if you're looking at the spiritual sort of religious history of this practice, this is a core, this is one of the core faith statements. Yeah, it's a little different from the Platonists or Pythagoreans or Orphics to, you know, the 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 Hermeticists and, um you know, the Stoics, they all have, they, each school is very different and astrology is able to be practiced and almost like transferred to a variety of different religious psychologies, you could say. But that's a core belief that doesn't seem to be, there doesn't seem to be any disagreement about that. That seems to be a unifying principle. So uh, we see this notion um, that is the, in both the East and the West, an ordered, beautiful, just, good, and true cosmos, wherein all apparent oppositions are ultimately ultimately bound or woven together by harmonia or ritta, this kind of cosmic unity. We see this notion especially popular, popularized in the West by many of the pre-Socratics, as well as the Pythagoreans, Plato, and others, with some likely ties to Egyptian and Babylonian cosmology, and it is also clearly existing as a core value in the ancient Vedas. So for me, this has become one of the ways to broadly define what it means to practice astrology as a, as a religious or spiritual part of my life. It is something that every day teaches me how to remember and see the cosmos as uh, ordered and harmonized, even though there are the appearance of battling opposites, that they all, they all have their place in a greater or grander cosmic unity. Um, I'm not saying it's a oneness where there are no distinctions. I'm saying that it's a well-ordered whole. Uh, cosmos, like the word, almost like the word cosmetic, um, you know, to, to put your to put all the different pieces of makeup on your face, all of your different um, pieces that fit together and present um, a beautiful whole, right? Although I will, tell, I'll, I will tell you, if you see my daughters trying to put chapstick on, they don't, <laughs> they don't fully understand yet that it goes on your lips because right now they'll just draw, <laughs> just draw it all over your face, uh, or my face or their own. Anyway, so uh, yeah, so one of that, this has become one of my core faith statements. When my parents, when people ask me, "What do astrologers believe? What is it all about?" I say, well, every day that we practice astrology, it is helping us to perceive the unity, the beauty, the order, not in a, you know, strict law, like uh, not in a restrictive sense, but the, the the beautiful, eloquent laws of the universe that astrology, and there's, you know, science can do that for us too. I'm, I have several good friends who are scientists and atheists. And, you know, I, I see that, that in a sense, I mean, this is just me, right? I don't mean to, I'm putting this on them in a sense, that's not fair, but I see them essentially living with a faith in Ritta or Harmonia too, because part of their, they, they, they approach science. Many people do who don't have a belief in, in any of, uh, you know, 
God or the soul or whatever, but they approach science and they go, you know, I, it helps me understand that we live in a beautiful, awe-inspiring, meaningful, and like, like intelligent universe. So there's many different things that can, that can connect us to life in that way. But the point is that for ancient astrologers, the study of astrology was something that reinforced that we live in this kind of world. And that kind of world makes us, um, eager to participate. It gives us a sense of faith and trust in our experiences and in the nature of the unfolding of events in life. So this is where we're starting today. Uh, so in our next episode, we will be going into a conversation, um, uh, get a little bit deeper into the philosophy. We'll be talking about the one and the many, the one and the many, and that all of these different schools in the East and the West also dealt with this issue of the one versus the many. We'll also talk about the reality of God, divinity, the soul, uh, the the difference between spirit and matter. Uh, let's see, what else is on my list here? Reincarnation and karma, the different kind of uh, the basics that were believed, some of the things that are maybe more um, debatable. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about liberation and enlightenment, what ancient philosophers believed about it. We'll talk about the nature of time. We will talk about uh, purification, austerity, and techniques or practices of ecstasy. Uh, that ancient astrologers most likely had, um, or that was would have been pervasive at the time of ancient astrology. Um, and we will talk a little bit about secular humanism versus uh, spirituality in the ancient world and where astrology would have fallen into that conversation, which is still a conversation today. We have some people who are, you could just broadly say, are secular humanists, um, you know, versus people who are going to um, you know, look at the world through the lens of, of divinity in one way or another. And, and that was in the ancient world too. That was not, uh, that was not something that's unique to this day. Like not everyone was walking around, you know, in robes, uh, chanting the names of God in the ancient world. There were lots of people who didn't believe in any of this in the ancient world. And that's really interesting too, to talk about. There's some other interesting things we'll talk about, like the vegetarianism and nonviolence in the ancient world. Uh, we'll talk about the need to share or spread different, almost like evangelism, like the evangelism of different uh, religious groups and what they what they believed would save the soul and the importance of trying to teach or reach people to help them with suffering. So there's a lot of things on this list that we're going to go through. And um, I'll probably release this, uh, you know, maybe maybe one or two a week. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing it'll be like a seven or eight part series by the time it's all done. So yeah, uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. I'd love to hear um, your reflections as you're listening to this series. Again, I'm, I'm not doing this because I want you all to believe something. I'm doing it because I, for me, understanding these broad principles um, of, of faith that ancient astrologers appeared to have from one tradition to another really helped clarify my own and it's really strengthened my practice. So I hope it'll do the same for you. And uh, yeah, let me know what you thought of this first episode and I hope you guys have a great day today. Take it easy. Bye.